Sounds good. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get going, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, and hope you're all having a great summer evening. This is Mike Mutzel and Bettina Newman here with Zymogen, and we are very excited you could join us for the live event uh, tonight. We have a very fascinating discussion centered around methylation, uh, glutathione, and, and mitochondrial function, and associated genetic SNPs, taught by our friend and customer, Dr. Ben Lynch. For those of you that don't know Ben, uh, Dr. Lynch has an undergraduate degree in molecular biology from University of Washington, and his doctorate in naturopathic medicine from Bastyr, and he is founder of mthfr.net and president and CEO of seekinghealth.com. So, Dr. Lynch, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Okay, so we've got 45 minutes today, and I'm going to make the most of it as much as possible. Typically, this talk takes about two hours, so I did delete some of the slides to make it flow as well as I can. And we have an announcement at the end, too, that will take some of the pressure off. But let's get started right now and get cracking. So basic disclaimers, anything I'm presenting here is informational use only. Please, please present it with your doctor first, and I've done everything I can to make sure that I'm providing you accurate information, plus the information presented is, uh, is nothing to do for Zymogen. Okay, thanks. General overview today for this one-hour talk, I'm going to give you guys an overview of methylation and the importance of healthy diet, lifestyle, and the environment. It's a lot more than just genes. It's, it's everything. And we need to discuss the various biochemical pathways so you can take an understanding, a brief understanding of how why B12 is important, why folate is important, what is SAMe, what does it do, which is in SAMe uh, works in the transmethylation cycle, which is critically important, as you'll soon see. And the detoxification pathway, namely the glutathione production through transsulfuration, is also really, really important, but can also be very, very damaging to some individuals. You probably experience that right now when you take glutathione you feel terrible and we'll get into some of that today. Discuss the importance of healthy mitochondrial and cell membranes. These are critical. If your cell membranes are trashed and your mitochondria are trashed, so are you. So we're gonna work on how to optimize them and see what they do. And then he introduce the effects of common gene polymorphisms such as MTHFR. You guys probably all know what MTHFR is. That's what I started with and I realized that hey there's I think there's one more, one gene, more than one gene in the human body, and I started investigating other things, and that opened up a huge can of worms. So I'm going to see how those present to you how those genes work with diet and various nutrients and xenobiotics. Unfortunately, I don't have much time to get into xenobiotic uh, inhibition of these genes, but I'll name a few. Okay, so basic functions of methylation, they're they seem very basic here because it's just an ordered list, but basically methylation does everything in your body for you, and it's critical. If your methylation is imbalanced, you're not doing well. And as it continues to become disordered and dysfunctional, your symptoms are going to get progressively worse. And so I believe it's, my belief is if you don't optimize your methylation, you are going to get sick, and you'll get sicker and sicker. So if you look at these functions, say if you're wanting to get pregnant, methylation is critical. It turns on and off genes. So gene regulation during pregnancy is absolutely critical. How you process chemicals and your own chemicals inside your body, endogenous compounds and xenobiotic compounds, things that are from the environment, environmental toxins, methylation does that. How you build neurotransmitters, so epinephrine and melatonin, methylation produces this. How you get rid of neurotransmitters so you don't get seizures or too stressed out, uh, long-term stressors like norepinephrine and dopamine. You need to get rid of dopamine as well. These things are supposed to be built and then eliminated, not stay around forever. Estrogen. Estrogen is a major, major hormone in women that causes estrogen-sensitive cancers. So we have to make sure that you can process your estrogen very well. And if you can't, then that's a methylation deficiency probably. Build immunity cells, immune cells, T cells, NK cells, so fighting infection. If you can't fight infection very well, your methylation is possibly disturbed. DNA synthesis repair. Thymine is a DNA base, and it's uh, also known as 5-methyluracil. Uracil is an RNA base, and once uracil gets methylated, you've got your DNA base as thymine, so that's pretty important. 
You don't want a bunch of uracils in your DNA. That's not good. Produce energy. Many of you are possibly tired, or if you know somebody who's tired, well, methylation creates your CoQ10, your carnitine, your creatine, your adenosine triphosphate. All these things are critical. It produces your protective coating on your nerves, your myelination. How many people who have symptoms of multiple sclerosis don't really actually have MS, but they just have a methylation deficiency or B12 deficiencies or folate deficiencies or something going on with their methylation? So it's another big one. Build and maintain your cell membranes. Phosphatidylcholine is the key component of every single cell in your human body. And if your phosphatidylcholine production is low, then your cell membranes are going to be suffering and getting leaky. Just like you heard of leaky gut, you've got leaky cells, and that's not good. How is methylation disturbed? Well, first off, you've got lack of nutrients. If you're not get, eating adequate nutrients such as uh, zinc or B2 or magnesium, B6 or B12, these reactions cannot move forward. They end up getting stuck. And you can get these nutrients, obviously, from your food or supplementation. Medications. Many, many medications disturb methylation. It's a laundry list. And antacids are a really big one. Cytochrome P450 inhibitors, uh, antacids do that. So that's also really bad. Methotrexate, metformin, these, everybody is on these things nowadays. Nitrous oxide at the dentist. I spend a little bit of time on detail on that one today. Specific nutrients depleting methyl groups, such as high-dose niacin. I know many, many functional medicine doctors love high-dose niacin. I love high-dose niacin. You just have to be careful when you're using it because you can deplete SAMe. Environmental toxicity, heavy metals, chemicals, acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is, is released from yeast, candida overgrowth. That shuts down your methionine synthase and hence your methylation cycle. Acetaldehyde is also the component of alcohol. So if you're drinking your alcohol and on a Friday, Saturday night, or Monday morning if you choose on a holiday, you're converting that into acetaldehyde, and that is bad news. That also shuts down your methylation. Excessive substrate, meaning if you take a supplement, say high-dose DMG, you can be shutting down one of those enzymes and increasing your homocysteine. That is a research fact. Glutathione, if you're supplementing directly with glutathione, you're shutting down your body's ability to produce glutathione because why should it do work if it doesn't need to? So there's methylfolate. If you take too much methylfolate, you can be shutting things down there as well. So everything in moderation. Gene mutations, polymorphisms, MTHFR, and GSMT1 is for glutathione, PMT for phosphatidylcholine, MAT for methionine, or for actually for s uh, methionine, SAME. GMT for creatine, CBS for glutathione production in an indirect, somewhat direct way, and your mental state. So methylation is, is disturbed by how you think. It's how you perceive the environment. Bruce Lipton does a fantastic job on this. So I really want you guys to take a pen and paper or make a mental note right now to go on YouTube and watch Bruce Lipton, or you can go to mthfr.net and type in Bruce Lipton in the search box there and, and uh, watch a video on him. He really gets into how you perceive the environment affects your internal environment, and this, it's beautifully done. Here's methylation in a very simplified, basic way, and I'd like to make it more basic than this, but at the moment, this is what we've got. So right here, you've got your folate cycle, which intersects right here next to the methionine cycle. This is also known as a transmethylation cycle. And then just south of the, uh, the methionine cycle, the transmethylation cycle, you've got the transsulfuration cycle, which is right here, which is where homocysteine gets converted into glutathione and numerous other things. So you can see that this intersection with folate is really, really important. And a lot of you know that folate is critical for preventing cancer, and if you have cancer, a lot of doctors will put you on antifolate drugs to inhibit methylation. And while that may have an immediate benefit of reducing the growth of cancer, it definitely has a, a long-term consequence because you're furthering damage from folate antagonists. So let's take a real quick at this look, quick look at this, and see what it does when you eat. 
So these are some critical nutrient or critical areas where diet impacts your methylation cycles and your folate cycles and your transsulfuration cycle. So let food be thy medicine. All right? Hippocrates was not an idiot. He's the father of medicine and he knew diet is really, really important. So this is really the only slide I'm done, so thank you very much. I'm finished. So have a good day. No, I won't leave you there, but I want you guys to really understand that diet is huge. Diet you need methionine, you get that from your diet. You need your folic, your tetrahydrofolate, you get that from your diet. You're getting lots of folic acid from your diet. That's far from good. That causes a lot of issues. I can't stand folic acid, but never mind. Uh, at least for this, we'll get to that detail some other time. Uh, you need your 5-methylfolate. This is a very critical nutrient as that starts driving your whole transmethylation cycle. If you don't have adequate 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate, you're bumping your head right here, and this doesn't doesn't spin. Vitamin B12 also from your diet. If you don't have that, this doesn't spin. Okay, down here, you're getting uh, homocysteine from your diet, and a lot of you think that oh, homocysteine is bad. Well, no. If you're low on homocysteine, you can't continue this cycle going. You cannot make your glutathione. A lot of autistic kids are actually low in homocysteine, so homocysteine is, is needed. And betaine you also get from your diet. Uh, beets, quinoa, that's a very good source. Lamb is also very high in betaine. So all these nutrients and cofactors and enzymatic reactions are supported through diet. And a key um, building block, block for glutathione is right here, cysteine. If you're low in cysteine, you are not making glutathione. And cysteine, you get a great amount from eggs. So highly recommend getting these nutrients from your food. So there's your glutathione, which you discussed, and here's your SAMe. So glutathione is your master antioxidant, and SAMe is your master methyl donor, so your master methylator, and these two are critical. Now, what if you're a vegan or vegetarian? Well, you're going to be low in choline, you're going to be low in B12, and you're also going to be low in phosphatidyl, well, that's phosphatidylcholine, so carnosine is another big one. So choline and B12 is only from animals. Now, you can supplement with those, and that's just great, and I highly recommend that you do if you're a vegan or vegetarian. My brother is one, and I have no disrespect for people who chose to choose that pathway. I was vegan or vegetarian for a long time as well. I didn't do it right. I felt sick, and I had to get back on the animal protein. Vegetables and fruits, critical. Nuts and seeds, also critical. Now, how many of you are gluten-free or on a low-carbohydrate diet because you don't do well with that? Well, very hard to get vitamin B6 without grains. If you're low on vitamin B6, you're not driving your transsulfuration cycle very well, and your production of glutathione is not going to do very well either, and not to mention your neurotransmitter production, which is not shown on this slide, but B6 is critical for your neurotransmitters. So some key genes, these are just a brief sampling of some genes that I found to be critically important. So here's your MTHFR here, here's your MTRR here, here's your methionine uh, MAT here, your CBS here, GSMT1 is down over here, PMT is here, BHMT here. So all of these things are pretty critical. Now, if you got MTHFR, methylfolate doesn't get produced very well and it starts slowing the cycle down. You get some from food but not enough, especially in our current standard American diet. Then you start getting lack of full, uh, B12 in your diet and if you have lack of B12 and lack of folate, you're really butting your head against the wall here with these genes. So you need to bypass them. Now Estidensial methionine, or SAMe, if you have an enzymatic defect here, you're not producing your SAMe. I know some individuals who are take the methylfolate, they'll take the B12, they'll have adequate ATP, and they'll have adequate methionine and magnesium, but they don't feel good. They still don't feel good. They, st they feel better if they take SAMe directly. Well, why is that? Well, they might have a mutation in the MAT enzyme, which is right here. So if they take this directly, they're bypassing all this work and they feel better. So that's the beautiful, beautiful thing of nutrigenomics. And another enzyme here, BHMT. This is really important. Now keep in mind that 
some people think that if you go, let me hit back real quick. So if you block this enzyme and you block this enzyme either through nutrient deficiency, xenobiotic or chemical interference, or you've got a genetic defect here, polymorphism, they think, well, you can still make uh, CME and bypass uh, the homocysteine in methionine. Well, you can, but this enzyme right here, the betaine enzyme, is only pretty much located in your liver and your kidney, whereas your 5-methylfolate or your MTHFR enzyme and your methionine synthase are found a lot of other places. So that's a critically important point. Homocysteine, if your CBS is uh, slowed down, there's, there's two major types of defects in CBS. Actually, there's multiple CBS enzymatic defects, but there's an enzyme defect in CBS that causes it to slow down, and you can get elevated homocysteine. Most commonly that we know about is the 699 variant of CBS, and that speeds up your homocyste or the CBS enzyme, which then depletes your homocysteine levels, drives them too low, pushes everything down here, and depletes your uh, SAMI, which we'll get into that later. But that's a, just a brief snapshot of what some of these enzymatic defects can do. Here's another look, just the same, same idea, but it kind of shows it in a cleaner picture. Now this is flipped, so here's your folate cycle here on the right, here's your transsulfuration cycle on the left, and then your trans, uh, you know, so it's folate cycle here, transmethylation cycle here, and your transsulfuration cycle would be down here. Okay, so here's the MTHFR, and that needs riboflavin to work. And a key point, just a little plug here, hypothyroidism can somewhat inhibit the MTHFR enzyme. So even if you don't have MTHFR or you have adequate riboflavin, hypothyroidism can cause an MTHFR defect-like issue. So it slows your folate cycle down and thus your trans methylation cycle, which I found just yesterday as being a really key point. So here, this enzyme right here, so here is your BHMT, your betaine. Now, PEMT produces phosphatidylcholine, and that needs SAMe in order that for that to happen. Okay, that's really important. So if you don't have adequate SAMe, you're not making your phosphatidylcholine. Also, if you don't have adequate SAMe, you are not uh, working well with your DNA methyltransferases, which regulate all the DNA methylation and methylate your DNA, which turns on your, your DNA and turns it off. So that's a really big deal. Some DNA you want to have turned on, such as for producing your methylfolate, and other genes you want to have turned off, like your... Um, your stem cells, you got to keep those turned off. So let's look at what SAMe does. So SAMe is one of the main, is the main methyl donor in your body, as we looked at earlier. And you need methylfolate, you need B12, and you need magnesium, and you need functioning enzymes without any inhibition for this to happen. So what does SAMe do? Why is it so important? Well, it regulates your gene expression. It produces your phosphatidylcholine. So phosphatidylcholine needed for every single cell in your body, cell membranes. It produces your CoQ10. It's a major antioxidant. It's needed for your heart health. It repairs your proteins. <laughs> your body is full of protein. Everything is pretty much protein in your body. So your bones, your skin, your eyes, your intestinal lining, okay? Everything has got some aspect of protein in there. Producing niacin, um, or metabolism of niacin, excuse me. Producing creatine. Now we're going to get into that here in a second. And activating histamine. A lot of people have allergies right now. Well, is your SAMe, is your methylation deficient? Maybe something to look at. Regulating your homocysteine. Producing your epinephrine. Producing your melatonin. You're not sleeping well at night? Well, perhaps you're not getting adequate SAMe production. And then your melatonin synthesis is reduced. Your epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine inactivation. Do you get stressed out? Do you see a police car behind you while driving and it takes you a long, long time to calm down? Well, you need Sammy possibly to 
help metabolize those neurotransmitters. And a key one right here, metabolizing endogenous and xenobiotic compounds. Endogenous meaning things like estrogen. So you've got to get rid of these things. They're supposed to be produced and eliminated. And xenobiotic compounds such as bis bisphenol A, uh, that's a big one. So getting rid of that. So remember, creatine, you need SAMe. Fine. Okay, well, half of your daily requirement of creatine comes from food. So if you're eating meat, you're getting half of your daily requirement from food. That's fantastic. But the other half is replenished by your body. Okay, well, fine. But it's very, very demanding to make creatine. Creatine synthesis requires 40 to 70 percent of your available methyl groups provided by SAMe. So if you are not eating enough creatine in your diet, if you are a vegan or vegetarian, or even if you are a meat eater, then you are still consuming massive amounts of your SAMe in order to make creatine. So if you have any symptoms of fatigue or exercise-induced fatigue or muscle spasms, then creatine is most likely low. And if you're an athlete and you're a triathlete, a marathon runner, and you've been feeling great and now you, your health is starting to slide, creatine for you is critical because you can start seeing getting depression and neurological disorders and cancers and what have you from becoming depleted in SAMe just by producing enough creatine. So I think creatine is a really important nutrient to supplement with in order to reduce the demand on your SAMe so you can make your phosphatidylcholine, so you can make your SAMe, so you can get rid of xenobiotics and endogenous compounds and so you can make your CoQ10 and your other nutrients needed for SAMe. Okay, so that's a really important plug for creatine. And there's various forms of creatine, but I'm not getting into that right now. And another key point is a lot of autistic children have low creatine. And as a physician, if you're looking on their labs and you're seeing their creatinine values, say on a heavy metal provoked urinal urinalysis, and their creatinine levels are low, well, their creatine synthesis is low. Or they're not eating enough food that has creatine. But most likely, their methylation demand is, is not doing well. So be looking into creatine for kids. And there's also a genetic defect right here, GAMT, which I've uh, started screening for. And when I find GAMT, it's, uh, it's a big one for people. Now we're going to switch into a little bit of what food can do that's harmful. Now dietary catechols can inhibit your DNA methyltransferase. That means it can inhibit the clearance of, of uh, estrogens. It can also slow down the uh, methylation of your DNA. So I know on some very, very popular TV show that they're discussing green tea extract or green coffee bean extract for losing weight. Well, green coffee bean extract is massively high in catechols. And so a lot of these people are seeing benefits of losing weight, but they're also greatly inhibiting their methylation by taking that green coffee bean extract. So if you're taking that, stop, please. Acidenosyl homocysteine is a, is a major um, inhibitor of SAM. So I don't want to get into that right now. Inhibition of DNA methylation by dietary catechols. So every one of my slides here, you will see the source. And after today's talk, you'll also be receiving this webinar. So you can go at your own rate. You can go full screen and you can grab, you can type in these URLs to grab my papers. Sometimes I just give the PubMed ID, but everything I, I discuss here is cited. So, and I just wanted to bring this to, to use because f food is medicine, but food can also be detrimental to a lot of people. And I know a lot of you work with patients who are very sensitive to foods. And I think this might be, you know, yet another reason why certain foods for certain people don't do well. 
And if you look at caffeine and potatoes and sweet potatoes and teas, these contain very large amounts of chlorogenic acid, which inhibit DNA uh, methylation. So uh, if you're dealing with pregnant, uh, pregnant women or your midwife, I think, uh, or an OB, I would be very careful with these people drinking caffeinated drinks or eating foods high in dietary catechols. Now, a lot of people are chronically ill because their immune system isn't working very well. And remember, methylation is very, very important for creating natural killer cells in your T cells. Now, if your methylation is deficient, your production of your T cells, your NK cells, is going to be low, and these immune uh, your immune response to kill these things is going to be inadequate and it's going to cause a long-term depletion of your immune system and then it's going to also cause a long-term demand on your immune system. So if you get rid of these viral infections or these bacterial infections, then that frees up your methylation cycle to do other things. So you want to fight those infections, you want to get those fevers, you want to get rid of them quickly so your methylation can do other tasks. So SAMe and betaine are really, really important for killing viruses. And hep C is a very nasty chronic disease that can lead to liver cancer. And not to mention, um, you know, lifelong subtle symptoms and issues which aren't very comfortable to live with. But look at the power of this. I mean, SAMe and betaine improve early virological response to chronic hep C. And again, the PubMed IDs are right here. You can go in and you can read those full studies. Now, Epstein Barr virus. A lot of people have chronic Epstein Barr, which is giving them chronic fatigue, or, and they're just suffering from it. And if you don't kill that virus, it's just going to keep sapping them. Possibly, poss their creatine levels are tired or and gone, so they're being fatigued because they're constantly trying to fight this virus. So get rid of it. Take some SAMe, take some betaine, support your methylation, and get rid of it. So uh, let's see. DNA, DNA methylation plays a critical role in Epstein-Barr viral gene silencing. That's huge. Okay. So, and if you're ingesting a bunch of your caffeine or your green tea, green tea or your green coffee extract, then you're going to be inhibiting your DNA methyltransferases, okay? But you want to have those DNA methyltransferases elevated, okay? If you have elevated DNA methyltransferase, or at least they're functioning, you have a latent virus, okay? So that means they're, they're calming down. They're going to be gone. So let's look at folate. This all started with MTHFR for me. I don't know where it started for you, but MTHFR for me was the first genetic polymorphism that I wrapped my head around, and that alone took a long time. And uh, But again, I'm realizing that it's much more important than just MTHFR. So let's look at what happens here. Here's folic acid. So folic acid is introduced in our food supply in order to prevent neural tube defects. It's fantastic, right? But it's is not a very good nutrient because if you take too much folic acid, it is processed by your body very slowly in order to get the dihydrofolate, which then is able to proceed to go down the rest of the folate cycle. Now here it even says dihydrofolate reductase is a very slow enzyme. Okay, so this, that's a very slow enzyme. Once you meet your physiological requirement for dihydrofolate all the rest of that folic acid that you're getting in your rich foods and your supplementation and folic acid is everywhere okay so you're not getting 400 micrograms of the RDA of folic acid you're probably getting milligram doses of folic acid all the rest of it gets shunted over here to this new marker that's in your blood called unmetabolized folic acid and unmetabolized folic, ac unmetabolized folic acid leads to uh, decreased natural killer cells and decreased natural killer cells leads to what? Decreased immunity and increased prevalence of viral or bacterial infections. If that happens, what are you doing? Well, you're constantly using up your methylation trying to fight these things. So you've got to be able to fight these. And I would stop using folic acid in your recommendations to your patients. It's trash. So if it's on your shelf, 
get rid of it. It seems like a very big, arrogant statement, but my research is, is very supportive. So use dietary folate, use folinic acid, which is here, or use your methyl folate down here. Okay. So this requires a lot of work. And it requires various nutrients as well. So the MTHFR enzyme is right here. Okay. So the MTHFR enzyme is inhibited, obviously, um, by having a polymorphism. If you have the 677 variant of the MTHFR gene, then to produce enough methylfolate, it's very, very hard because if you have two copies of the 677 variant of MTHFR, you are reducing the production of methylfolate by upwards of 70%. If you have one copy of the 677 variant, you're reducing it by about 40%. Okay? The 1298 variant of, of MTHFR doesn't seem to affect methylfolate levels, at least not in research. And I haven't seen it on labs either in those that I've worked with 1298. But again, there's more than one gene in the human body. Okay. Now, the MTHFR enzyme is also inhibited by a lot of 5-methylfolate. Uh, and why is that important? So if you're taking a bunch of methylfolate, you are pushing this cycle over here, which you think is great. But, and it is important, but pushing it too hard isn't good. And you want to be able to inhibit your MTHFR enzyme so you can go over here and you can produce your purines, your adenine and guanine. And what are purines? Uh, purines are DNA bases. So a DNA base of adenine and guanine are needed to produce your DNA. And then over here, you have your uracil converting into thymine. Now, that is also important. So if you're just pushing, pushing, pushing this pathway and you have no inhibition over here on your MTHFR enzyme, you are going to have a limited ability to produce your adenine, limited ability to produce your guanine, and, or produce your thymine. Now, what is uracil? As I said earlier, uracil is an RNA base. Okay, so if you are deficient in uh, inhibiting your uh, MTHFR enzyme, or you're not eating adequate foods that have good forms of folate, or if you're eating too much folic acid and you're not getting through this pathway down here in order to produce uh, thymine, then you're going to have too much uracil that's actually incorporated in your DNA. So you, you can actually have uracil bases in your DNA. And over time, if you keep adding uracil bases to your DNA, your, your DNA has checks and balances and will constantly try to repair and cut out the, the uracil. But what happens if you keep having uracil cut out of your DNA, these splice points are very weak and brittle, and your DNA starts to break. And that's not good. So you don't want to be cutting and breaking your DNA. So functions of folate. There was a brilliant presenter that was at a conference a few months ago, and he said he finds Shakespeare in medicine. And to me, this is my Shakespeare. The functions of folate in human physiology are relatively simple, but the implications of their activity and dysfunction are profoundly far-reaching. That's a brilliant statement. Okay. So what are the functions of folate? You saw the folate cycle. You saw where the folate cycle meets into the transmethylation cycle and into the transsulfuration cycle. So obviously that's critical because you don't have adequate, adequate folate, you're not going to be pushing the transmethylation, thus you're not going to be producing your DNA, you're not going to be repairing your DNA, you're not going to be producing your neurotransmitter, uh, producing your neurotransmitters, you're not going to be eliminating um, your endogenous compounds or your xenobiotic compounds, and you're not going to be supporting white blood cells, red blood cells, or your platelets. So folate's critically important. So who's at risk for MTHFR? A lot of doctors keep asking me, well, why should I screen for MTHFR? Well, one comment for screening for MTHFR is it's highly prevalent. And two, it's covered by insurance. And three, if someone has MTHFR and they're not screened for it and they undergo chemotherapy, they're going to get very, very sick. If they go to the dentist and they take nitrous oxide, they're going to get very, very sick. If they don't know they have MTHFR, they're going to be a lot more susceptible to miscarriages, infertility, 
preeclampsias, uh, all sorts of mental disorders. So it's a very good thing to find. Okay. So if you look here, the Mexican population, if you work in a rural area or this, an area that's high in the Mexican population, we are talking here the homozygous uh, gene mutation of the MTHFR677 variant. Okay, Look how prevalent it is in the Mexican population. Nearly 40%. Italians, 35%. Okay, And the Hispanics, 30%. So 20%. So I don't know who said that the prevalence of the 677 variant is only in 7% of the population. Hooey. That's BS. It's it's far from that. Okay. Now, again, this is the most severe, well, I shouldn't say the, there's very, very severe forms of MTHFR, but this is a very severe form in and of itself. It's not the most severe, but it's very severe. Now, again, homozygous MTHFR reduces the ability for EMTHFR enzyme to make methylfolate by 70%. You have a 70% inhibition or inability to produce methylfolate. That means you've got to either get that from food or supplementation. Okay. Now, if you have one copy of the 677 allele in MTHFR, you are reducing your methylfolate production in the enzyme by about 40%. Now, how many in the population have one copy? about 45 percent. Okay, So one in two of your patients has a 677 variant and as you start testing and seeing this you are going to be saying yes I'm seeing about one in two of my patients have this and you're actually going to start saying well I'm actually have more than that because people come into your office are sick. Now remember I talked about nitrous oxide and inhibition of MTHFR. Now this is a really really important thing to discuss because nitrous oxide is very prevalent in America and probably overseas. So you go to the dentist, you have dental work done, you're going to get nitrous. You have a kid who has dental issues, they're going to get nitrous. And if you have a kid who's autistic and has MTHFR or is autistic and doesn't have MTHFR or you have someone who's sick and doesn't have MTHFR but they have a B12 deficiency or a folate deficiency or a methionine deficiency, then you've got major problems. Okay? And I've read research that shows that a single dose of nitrous oxide can cause irreversible neurological damage. Now I've I've gone to conferences where dentists will come up to see and come up to me and say, you know, I've used nitrous on thousands of patients without any issue. I don't know about that. I would say that's fantastic, but I also urge you to uh, heed my warning here with this. Okay, now look at what nitrous oxide does. Now, here's your methionine synthase activity. So let's suppose that you have 100% functioning of your methionine synthase. Okay, that means you have adequate folate, means you have adequate B12, means you don't have any xenobiotic inhibition. You don't have any yeast overgrowth that's causing acetylhydrate inhibiting your methionine synthase. Okay, so let's say it's 100% normal. If you take nitrous, okay, you are inhibiting your methionine synthase. That is where the folate cycle meets the transmethylation cycle. You are inhibiting that by 80%, upwards of 90%. It's huge. Okay, this is in the brain. This is in the liver. Right, so and even after two days, there's still inhibition in the liver. It's pretty much recouped by the brain in the brain. Okay, so here it is, right here. So this is where your nitric oxide interferes. That's right where S-adenosylmethionine is is needed. Uh, the cofactors are needed to produce your S-adenosylmethionine. So this is a critical thing. If you go to the dentist and your patients go to the dentist and they have to take nitrous oxide because the dentist won't do anything else, then preload them please with methionine. Load them with folates and load them with B12 and you can do a post-loading dose as well. Okay? But you can also use uh, oxygen, you can use your homeopathics, you can use uh, various things to also calm people down or you can just use uh, local anesthetic in the area.
So your patient tests for positive for MTHFR, what do you do? You give them high dose methylfolate, you give them your Deplin, you give them Metanex, uh, you give them Fulby, Fulgard, what have you. Uh, well, you can, and maybe 50, 60, 70 percent of the time you're going to get good results. Maybe 80 percent of the time you're going to get good results. But those that are B12 deficient are not going to be getting results. And also people who are very sick are going to get worse. So it's not a good idea to just jump to methylfolate if di uh, MTHFR is diagnosed. Obviously in some situations it is, but it depends on what's going on. So here is one reason why you don't start with just methylfolate. A lot of the population is deficient in B12. Most labs well, actually, all labs state that the normal range for B12, I forget the exact range, but it's around 150 or something, uh, designates a deficiency in vitamin B12. That's not right. So anything, in my opinion, less than 400, 500 on a B12, you know, serum B12, is low. So you want to make sure that B12 is on board, and you can't necessarily give B12 first on board. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And if you can give B12 to an individual and they feel great from it, fantastic. You can also give folate in conjunction with B12, methylfolate that is. So you can give methylfolate in conjunction with B12 to help drive and bypass the MTHFR variants. And, and uh, a lot of people can feel much better from that. If they're very sick, then that's not where you want to start. If they're coming into your office and they're depressed and they're somewhat lethargic and and maybe they're um, you know just generally not doing well, but they're not horrifically bad, you can probably start out with methylfolate and methylcobalamin and, and improve their life. And away they go, and you feel like a hero, and you are because you bypass the problem and address the cause at the genetic level, which is pretty sweet. Okay, but there are a lot of defects and issues with B12. I mean, we all know that B12 absorption is very difficult. You need an acidic environment in the gut. Then you also need, once that happens, then you need to be able to transport the B12. And a lot of physicians don't know about transcobalamin. And transcobalamin is really critical to transport your B12. And transcobalamin levels, if deficient, are going to cause a B12 deficiency. And so testing for serum methyl or urinary methylmonic acid is a very good uh, lab to test for B12. Again, urinary MMA is the best. You can also do uh, serum MMA or blood. I forget the exact test for that. Okay. So if you give B12 to your patient, or you take B12 and you feel terrible, you get way, way worse, you get tingling, you get headaches, uh, you get pain, what is going on? Well, thanks to Dr. Deeth, he's a PhD out of Boston, I believe, or Chicago. Um, he's just retired now, but Dr. Richard Deeth, he's a PhD and brilliant man, he works with dopamine, but I got this from his paper. Now, Cobalamin is your B12. Okay, you've got methylcobalamin, hydroxycobalamin, and acetylcobalamin. And after you get rid of that, you, after you convert hydroxyl to methylcobalamin, your adenis, or you convert hydroxyl to methyl or adenosylcobalamin, you have your cobalamin left over. Okay, now if your cobalamin is a one here, then that can be oxidized, and as, as long as you have adequate methylfolate, you will take that cobalamin and you will convert it to cobalamin 3, which is methylcobalamin. Okay? So if you do that, then you are not oxidizing this cobalamin. So if you preload a patient with methylfolate prior to giving B12, if you know they don't do well with cobalamin, methylcobalamin, that can help reduce their symptoms from B12. Some people also get anxious from uh, B12, so that's a, a separate area. But 
this is a really important point and I'm going to have to adjust my protocol on this having seen this and this is why uh, it's so important to stay up to speed with the current research and also my work because I'm constantly improving and adjusting things. In fact, half an hour prior to this webinar, I was adding things to the slide based upon my latest findings in glutathione, which were uh, last night. So uh, things change. And as I continue to improve my research, then uh, I'll pass that on to you. But again, supporting with adequate levels of folate can help reduce the oxidative stress that can be caused by cobalamin-1 as it converts to cobalamin-3. And cobalamin-1 is known as a supernucleophile, which is very, very reactive. Okay? So that can start binding to iron. It can start binding to nitrogens and copper. Okay? And that can cause a lot of damage. So a lot of people talking about their CBS polymorphism, okay? And if you have the CBS SNP, you're all freaking out because, uh, well, it's a bad one. It's, it's, it's something to be uh, wary of. And if you have the CBS 699 variant or your patients do, then that's something to be uh, very cognizant of. And do not give your 5-methylfolate or your B12 if you see a CBS SNP in, in your patient is you will probably make them worse because what is happening is this is, is sped up in those with the 699 variant and it will start draining this pathway, okay? And that means you're not getting enough s methionine and so on. So what I recommend instead of doing methylfolate and your methylcobalin with these patients is to support with phosphatidylcholine, your CoQ10, your creatines, the things that CME are useful for. Okay. So, but a key point here is increased oxidative stress will naturally increase your CBS enzyme or that of your patient. So if your patient has increased oxidative stress, what's going to happen is this enzyme will be upregulated on its own. You do not need a, a variant or polymorphism for that to happen. So this enzyme will be upregulated in oxidative stress. That means in oxidative stress, your patient is not going to be producing enough SAMe. Okay? If they're not producing enough SAMe, they're not producing CoQ10, they're not producing their creatine or their phosphatidylcholine and so on. All right? And they're not going to be getting rid of their estrogens. That's a key point. Mitochondrial cell function, they're very, very sensitive. They are the first to go. Okay, so if you have increased oxidative stress, the mitochondria are going to die. Okay, that's, that's pretty much it. And if the mitochondria die, the cells die. And if the cells die, that's further oxidative stress because the cells release a bunch of harmful metabolites and so on. Okay, so here. Proper regulation of those of these mitochondrial functions is vitally important for the life and death of the cell and for the organism as a whole. Okay, so if you have oxidative stress in the individual, or if those people who have CBS polymorphisms or the upregulation of the CBS through oxidative stress, you've got to support the mitochondria first. And the mitochondrial outer membrane here, if it's permeable, that leads to cell death. What is a cell membrane made out of? Phosphatidylcholine. Okay. So glutathione is readily oxidized. Okay, I've got to jump through here because we're already uh, only 10 minutes left. Um, so, Mike, I'm just going to go for another few minutes and then we'll uh, cut off to questions. Um, took longer than I thought, apologize, but these points That's are very great. important. So uh, here is a big mess, all right? So the, here's your oxygen. Oxygen leads to uh, nitric oxide, which you need for vasodilation and blood flow in patients, but that can lead to peroxynitrate. How has that gotten rid of? Peroxynitrate is very, very toxic. Glutathione gets rid of that, okay? The glutathione can make a thiol radical, and thiol radical turns into oxidized glutathione. So if you have oxidized glutathione, 
that will stay inside the mitochondria. So you will have oxidized glutathione staying in the mitochondria because it cannot get out unless you've got the glutathione reductase enzyme functioning with adequate NADPH or niacin. So that's a very, very key point. So niacin, even though it depletes SAMe, it can uh, be life-saving for, uh, I shouldn't say life-saving, just very, very important for people who have uh, sensitivity to glutathione. So if people are taking their glutathione and they do not feel well, then they're probably getting uh, stuck with their, reduce, or their oxidized glutathione inside the cell, so niacin can help. Okay. So importance of glutathione, 15% of the cellular glutathione is located in your mitochondria. Okay, And your mitochondria are tiny. They're tiny. So most of the mitochondria is glutathione. And if your glutathione is oxidized and not reduced, that mitochondria is going to die. If the mitochondria dies, the cell dies. If the cell dies, then in time, the, so will the patient. Okay, so here are all the um, various points here about labs. So starting low or slow and evaluating your patient. History is critical. You cannot do methylation work with your patients in 15 minutes. It's impossible. You can't do it in 30 minutes. If you do it in 30 minutes, then you need one patient visit just to go over their, their history. If you're going to do it in 30 minutes, then you're also going to have to pre- uh, evaluate your patient before they even step a foot into your office by giving a very, very good, thorough questionnaire. And that's what I used to do. And my clients used to give me pages and pages of history. And prior to even starting uh, work with them, I had a solid uh, background of their history and I could understand where to start just from that. Testing uh, is inherently full of issues and does not provide typically what you need. History is number one. Okay, And you cannot start methylation support if your patient is really sick. If your patient is really sick and you start methylation support, you are going to make them worse. So again, you've got to reduce and quench the oxidative stress. You've got to repair the cell membranes. And you've got to support the mitochondria first. You've got to evaluate the sulfur sensitivity. You see that. You know there's a CBS upregulation. There's a CBS upregulation then you know there's increased oxidative stress, right? You should know that by now because of the increased CVS uh, activity through oxidative stress. And uh, you got increased uh, sulfate production through the CVS enzyme. Evaluating liver function is really important. If you've got a patient with a fair, fast phase one and a slow phase two, you are uh, got an imbalanced patient on your hands and they are producing all sorts of radicals and damage. So you got to speed up the phase two, slow the phase one. And labs, these are some really good labs to run. And evaluating how your patients are feeling is critical. You cannot be saying, see me in a month. That's not going to work. You have to have a reduced patient load, and patients are going to have to wait in line in order to see you. You have to work with your current patients, schedule them more frequently in the beginning, Then, as they get better, you can make your patient visits longer. So you can't go fast here, and you can't use high-dose nutrients. So Doctor's data, here's a Paddock's detox profile that looks at phase one, phase two, and creatine, okay? Your creatinine levels. Creatinine levels are low on your patient, then you know creatine uh, needs some support. And B12 and folate both support phase one. Now phase one, phase two, it's kind of an archaic way to say how uh, endogenous and xenobiotic toxins are eliminated through the body, but for simplification purposes, I'm going to stick to phase one, phase two, but uh, it's not always cut and dry with phase one and phase two. Uh, oxidative stress 2.0 by Genova. Blood oxidative stress 2.0 is very important. Okay, look at this lab. You can again, you're going to have a recording of this later, so you can review it. So review this is really important. Lipid peroxides. Lipid peroxides are a key uh, marker for oxidative stress. And if you see glutathione peroxidase being upregulated your SOD being upregulated in your patient, then you know there's oxidative stress. Okay. Methylation profile by doctor's data. It looks at your methionine, cysteines, your SAMs, your SAWs, your homocysteines, and your ratio of SAM to SAW. That is kind of the gold standard right now for looking at uh, methylation status in your patient. 
there are issues with that. I also don't know where the normals of these labs came from for any uh, for these lab companies. So where do they get their normal from SAM? Where do they get their normal for SAW? I don't know. So that's why I say lab testing isn't always the best. Here's health diagnostics report. It's very useful because it shows your folic acid derivates um, and the various uh, positions in the folate pathway. So quickly, if you if their 5-methylfolate levels are low, there may be an MTHFR enzyme or their diet could be screwed up. If their tetrahydrofolate is low, then you immediately know that their methylfolate and or their B12 levels are low. So this is a really cool test for this. Um, nitric oxide, you've got oxidative stress. Ammonia, you've got mitochondrial dysfunction. Glutathione low issues. Nitrotyrosine, that's uh, kind of a marker of peroxy nitrate. This is a lab from uh, Genova. This is the complete hormone panel. And this is really cool because it looks at current gene, gene function. So it looks at your CONTs. It looks at the cytochrome P450s. Um, so really sweet. So And it's very... Uh, just very well laid out. Um, here's also part of that test. So methylation activity, less methylation, more methylation. Okay, that's uh, again estrogen metabolism. Fatty acids. So how are the cell membranes doing? So fatty acids of red blood cells really important. So got to do it. Got to fix the cell membrane health. You got to look at the toxicity of your patient. So this is also Genova. Now this is a genetic test that I get through 23andMe, that I download the raw data, and these are the various genes that I work with. So GAD works with glutamate to GABA, MAO works with eliminating, uh, what is it, uh, serotonin, um, MTHFD1 is folate, uh, this is your folate receptors, here's uh, getting rid of your dopamine, uh, here's your processing of toxins, here's your glutathione, um, here are some other ones. So can't rely on labs. You got you can't be spacing your patient visits far out and uh, initially. Can't be aggressive. Uh, I learned the hard way on that one. You cannot say symptoms or do a detox. Uh, just push through it. We're wrong. You cannot. The patient has got to completely feel better every step of the way. If they're not, you got to adjust. There's no protocol. You can't go be going to conferences and trade shows and continuing ed education. Uh, courses and following a supplement protocol. It doesn't work and you can't stop learning. Okay, positive ending. Uh, how many people have neural tube defects in the United States uh, and Mexico and northern China, right? A lot of people. Now, if you look at the frequency of the MTHFR 677 variant in the US, Mexico, and China, so if you look at the, the rate at which you see the prevalence of the 677 homozygous variant compared to neural tube defects, there's a direct correlation, okay? But if you fly to Italy, then it's very, very common. Remember that slide that discusses how common it is to have the MTHFR 677 variant in the Italians? Well, it's very common, but they don't have neural tube defects. They do, but it's not nearly as high. So environmental and nutritional factors here are key. So you cannot be just testing genes in your patients and saying that's the issue. Environment and nutrition are key. Now, I want to invite all you guys to a full two-day seminar. What I just blasted through in an hour is uh, does not do it justice, and I probably gave you way more questions than answers, and Mike is going to uh, help appease that a little bit. But there is a full two-day conference being held at Bastyr on in October, the 12th and 13th, there's going to be kind of a meet and greet the night before, so we can all get to know each other. And on the day after Monday, there's going to be a 20 to 30 uh, doctor roundtable discussion. Um, that's kind of a separate deal. Uh, so if you'd like to work with me one-on-one -on -one with a group of 20 to 30 other doctors, that's going to be available for 20 to 30 docs. Now, there's 250 seats available for this conference only. And over 1,500 of you signed up for this. Actually, over 2,000 of you signed up for this webinar alone. And already 100 and some seats are taken for this conference. That means there's only 139 seats left. So if you are key to do this, if you have the time to do this for your patients, if you really want to address the root cause of disease in your patients, 
and understand where disease comes from and get to the root matter and understand the biochemistry and how to start with your very sick patients and you are motivated to do this and you are also very motivated to reduce the disease in unborn children which is my passion that I really encourage you to come to this first ever uh, seminar. It is going to be amazing and I have two full days to fully explain this. Okay, So here's a link to sign up here um, and here's the direct link here and again you're going to get this recording so you don't need to worry about writing it down. Okay, Now how to stay informed with what I'm doing uh, go to mthfr.net and opt in for the newsletter there. I don't spam. In fact if you, if you uh, are currently getting my newsletter there you know I don't write very much and when I do it's important so like today informing you of this webinar and I'm glad you made it. Facebook, I'm pretty active on my Facebook. There's a, a lot of good information there that I find because I'm very passionate about what I do and I like to uh, show and share my latest findings there. So that's at DR Benjamin Lynch on Facebook and again my newsletter on nhfr.net. So I apologize for the speed in which I blast blasted through this but uh, you know it's a start. Okay. So thanks a lot. Turning over to you Mike. Sure, fantastic. <clears throat> um, we have over 80 questions here, so I doubt we're going to get through that. And I know you have to go very shortly here, uh, Dr. Lynn. So, uh, Dr. Rindy, I saw you had a question right away. You, you want, you're live right now if you want. Okay, we will. Uh, you know what, um, Dr. Ben? Can you make it next, if we can do next Wednesday or next Thursday evening, and we can do a live Q&A for, for everyone uh, that's on the line right now. Um, again, we have over 80 questions. Not going to get through it. Uh, Dr. Lynch actually has another obligation that he has to get to very shortly. So uh, will that work for you, uh, Dr. Lynch? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it can be the same duration, 45 minutes of just pure Q&A. So I'm totally fine with that. 